Hello and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Sabrina Paganoni and I'm excited to be here uh, for our weekly webinar. We're giving people a few seconds to join from uh, the waiting room. Um, and today, like every week, uh, I'm here with Dr. Sukovic, uh, as well as Alison and Katrin, our patient navigation team. Uh, and today, next slide, we are also uh, here with Dr. Qureshi from uh, Biohaven Pharmaceuticals, so welcome. Uh, and uh, before we move on to the q and I wanted to give a, a quick update on our, uh, as we do every week, uh, on the progress that we're making in this trial. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, as you know, in this trial, uh, we are testing four investigational products at this time, uh, Zelucoplan, Verdiperstat, CNMA8, and Predopidin. Uh, as you know, this is a perpetual adapted trial with a shared placebo group, which is really uh, fantastic because we can learn more while minimizing um, placebo because we can really share placebo um, across different regimens, uh, which is obviously a wonderful feature of this trial. And we have an open label extension optional at the end of the placebo control trial. So for those of you who are following us every week, you're, you're familiar with the, uh, with the schema and, and, the, and the framework. So as every week, the most exciting part of the webinar is when we give enrollment updates. So if we can go to the next slide. I'm happy to share that we continue to make progress. Uh, and as of right now, over 700 people with ALS have signed informed consent. Over 600 have been assigned to a regimen. Over 500 have been randomized uh, to active or placebo. So they, they've started on drug. And uh, one thing we're very excited about is that um, 220 people have already finished the placebo controlled portion of the trial and are currently receiving uh, active drug in the open label extension. In terms of the breakdown by regimen, as you know, we started three regimens at the same time, A, B, and C, uh, and, and those are the ones who are really getting real close to um, target enrollment. Uh, target enrollment is approximately 160, and as you can see there, uh, we are really almost there. So uh, we're getting there uh, for regimen A, and we are at goal for B and C. Uh, obviously, we're also actively enrolling in D, uh, and as you know, after, um, and, you know, over the next few weeks, we will continue to add um, a, a new regimen, which is actually, um, you know, we're actively working on adding regimen E. So thank you so much for all your participation and support. Obviously, we couldn't be doing this trial without your, your partnership. So thank you for, for being with us and, and the great involvement. Next slide. Real quick, uh, these are, um, you know, our information about how to find us. Uh, you can find us online. Uh, this is all the information. We post the recording of this webinar and we share the slides. So feel free to share them with everyone. Next slide. And uh, we, uh, we, you all can always contact our patient navigation team outside of the webinar. Next slide. And we do have uh, a series of webinars planned. So that's uh, the, the schedule as we have it today. We have a couple of uh, guest speakers coming up. We have uh, Dr. Walk from the University of Minnesota, uh, as well as Dr. Miller from IMALS. Uh, and we'll be speaking in particular about uh, the EAP program. Um, and as many of you know, IMALS uh, helped us launch um, a, a, an EAP program in collaboration with Biohaven Pharmaceuticals, an EAP of, of a deeper start. Next, uh, next slide. And these are other webinar opportunities. These have been recorded and available on the NEILS website. Uh, and with that, I think we can, uh, I can turn it over to Dr. Sukovic uh, to start the Q&A session. Thank you, Sabrina, and welcome, um, Irfan. Um, so we wanted, to, before we go into the Q&A, we wanted to uh, discuss the recent announcement of um, the uh, trial results of verdipostat in a different disease, in a disease called multi-system atrophy. We've invited um, Dr. Kreshi from Biohaven to answer any of your questions about this. So I want to just start with a few points, is that um, in the, one of the, the key ones, which is that um, uh, the, the drug verdipostat was being tested in more than one disease. There's a rationale for it in ALS and there's a rationale for it in multi-system atrophy. And these two diseases are very different. So multi-system atrophy is a neurodegenerative disease that causes um, lots of symptoms that are different than, than in ALS and is also an illness that's very hard to diagnose and um, and is very early in its drug development. So I compare it to um, ALS like 20 years ago, where they're really starting the first trials in there. They're learning how to do trials in that illness, how to even measure the illness. And um, I really don't think one can 
look at what the drug does in that disease and make conclusions about what it might do in ALS. So the rationale for testing this in ALS is as strong as it was the day before we heard about the results in, in a different disease. And we do have lots of examples of drugs that work in one disease and not in the other. And Rilazole is actually one of those. Uh, Rilazole works you know, uh, in ALS, but there were trials in Huntington's and Parkinson's disease afterwards in stroke where it didn't work. And there's many, many other examples like that. But with that, maybe I'll, I'll pass to um, Dr. Kreshi to make, make some comments and then we'll, we'll open up the Q&A um, process. Great, thank you so much for the opportunity to join this webinar. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, and, and thank you all for listening. Um, <clears throat> as you heard, Biohaven recently announced that our phase three clinical trial evaluating verdipristat in multiple system atrophy uh, did not meet its primary or key secondary endpoints. Uh, while the top line data were negative, it's important to note that we have lots of additional analyses of the data that are currently ongoing. Uh, we remain committed to the development of verdipristat as an investigational disease modifying treatment for neurodegenerative diseases, including ALS. Um, <clears throat> We will continue to investigate Vidipraset and ALS in collaboration with the Healy ALS platform trial, uh, including supporting the open label extension of the, the platform trial. Uh, we'll also continue to provide early access uh, to Vidipraset for people living with ALS, uh, as we have been doing through the Healy ALS platform trial early access program, which was recently launched. So, you know, I, I want to also reiterate some of the things that Dr. Sakovich just said. Um, first, you know, we reported the results out, and I know a lot of media attention came to that uh, study result. But I'd say, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Um, I would trust Dr. Sakovich, Dr. Paganoni, and the other researchers in the Healy ALS platform trial. So if you have any questions, I suggest you speak with your doctor. Uh, they are the ALS experts and the best uh, to answer your questions. Um, second, I'd like to reiterate uh, that Verdipraset was selected for the Healy ALS platform trial by an international committee of leading ALS scientists uh, based on the scientific rationale, as Merritt said, uh, as strong today as it was then. Um, neuroinflammation plays an important role in ALS and verdipristat is believed to reduce neuroinflammation. Um, and then thirdly, I think it's really important to understand that there are two different diseases, ALS and multiple system atrophy. They impact the body differently they have different underlying causes. So the results from one study in multiple system atrophy really don't have any bearing on the study that's ongoing with ALS. The best way to know whether or not it's effective for people with ALS is to continue in the Healy ALS platform trial and to see the study results when the study is completed. Um, and so I'll just make some brief comments uh, about MSA. So, uh, you know, number one, while ALS affects motor neurons, ALS, a multiple system atrophy uh, affects multiple body systems. And these cause symptoms that are very different than those in ALS. People with multiple system atrophy can have disease uh, symptoms that seem like Parkinson's disease. So things like tremor, uh, they can also have difficulty in coordination and balance and they have failure of the autonomic nervous system, which uh, can manifest in different ways, but one of the major ways is having low blood pressure that can cause dizziness and passing out when standing up. These are really different from the symptoms that people have in ALS. Um, and, and ALS and multiple system atrophy are also very different at a, at a molecular and cellular level. When you look at ALS under the microscope, you often find a protein deposit of a protein called TDP43. Uh, by contrast, when you look at MSA under the microscope, you see a protein called alpha-synuclein. Alpha-synuclein is a protein that you might have heard of. It's also present in Parkinson's disease. There is no evidence of alpha-synuclein deposits in people with ALS. So there are differences across the diseases, and the effect or lack of effect in one disease or another um, 
can't be directly applied to ALS. Uh, they're just two different in, in really important ways. And a, as Dr. Skovich said, you know, we see this example all the time, including with Riluzol, and that I'll add that many years ago, Riluzol was also studied as a potential treatment for multiple system atrophy. And while we know that Riluzol is effective for people with ALS, it is not effective for people with MSA. So I think we know across many different diseases, we're hopeful that we can have a potential impact with Rudiprostat. And I think the best way to, to know whether we can for ALS is to continue in the ALS platform trial. Thank you, Irfan. I think we'll open up for questions if people can put them in the um, in the chat and, uh, or the Q&A and we'll, we'll make sure to get to all of them. We have a few that came in in advance and these can be questions about uh, any part of the platform trial or about regimen B for Dipaset. Please ask anything that's on your mind. Um, so Sabrina, maybe the first question to you, it says, are there any other drugs which look promising to either cure or permanently stabilize ALS? Well, we. As, as discussed in previous webinars, we continue to look uh, broadly and continue to engage actively uh, with many different companies that uh, potentially could uh, participate in, in the platform trial. So absolutely, there's a lot of research that's going on, um, you know, in addition to the drugs that are currently in the trial, um, one regimen is going to be added shortly and then there's others that will follow. So, so again, I think there are, um, many drugs that are in development with that goal and we continue to actively um, engage with the companies that produce them. Thank you. Here's a question for, um, uh, there's two questions for Irfan. Um, one is um, that came in, in advance, which which is, did are we treating long enough with Verdipocet in the Healy platform trial? And, and is there any lessons from the MSA trial on length of duration? For example, did in the MSA trial, did the drug look like it was working initially and then didn't work or was it starting to trend? Anything we can learn from that to help an ALS? Yeah, it, it's a great question. So uh, I think the first thing that we can say is that the Healy ALS platform trial is designed by uh, the, the Healy ALS team uh, in, in ways that are really, really important uh, that are different from the MSA trial. The population obviously is different. We have ALS patients instead of MSA patients. Uh, we have a 24 week primary endpoint. And, and that's based on a lot of evidence and data from previous ALS studies to design the most efficient trial, which we know the Healy ALS platform trial is. Um, and in addition, the trial is built with futility analyses and things to confirm that the trial is progressing well and that if a drug has no chance of having a successful outcome, that the, it will be deemed futile. And that's, again, an important difference in the design of the Healy trial from the MSA study that we conducted. What we can learn from the MSA study, uh, I, I can say, is that you know there seems to be an effect of um, you know sort of the, the drug in terms of the phase two study that was done in, you know, prior to the, the phase three that we did, that's why we launched the phase three study. Um, in the phase three study, 48 weeks, we developed a new endpoint, uh, basically a new way to measure disease progression. And those are very different than the measures that are used in the Healy ALS platform trial. So the measures that we use for ALS are very well understood. We know they have, how they've performed in many years of uh, clinical trials. For MSA, we developed the first, uh, you know, and, and used an endpoint for the very first time. So I don't think we can take that lesson about disease progression, but I think that, you know, we can take some evidence about the safety and tolerability profile and things like that, uh, which a, as we reported, uh, we're not, uh, we didn't see anything unexpected. So, so that's good news. And I think that uh, the duration of the trial really for Healy is designed specifically for ALS and is the right duration. Thank you. So um, Sabrina, there's a question about the EAP for Verdipostat. It just wanted you, if you could elaborate on that. 
Can yeah, I mean, we, we were very excited to partner with IMALS and Biohaven um, uh, and to launch uh, this first EAP companion to the platform trial. So essentially the goal here is to uh, provide early access to people who are not eligible for the trial. And we're trying to do that for all the drugs that are in the platform trial. Verdiprestat was the first one that we launched. Uh, and, and a few weeks ago, we started enrolling uh, a few participants that's uh, available at three sites. Uh, and um, again, um, they are um, MGH, Duke and Northwestern, and they're all active in rolling. I would say that the goal of the trial is to provide access for people who are not eligible for the trial. And, and as of right now, it's a small program. Uh, However, it is an important program because it shows sort of like the, the, the fact that we should establish EAPs for all trials. And so again, that's, that's a, um, I think a great example and hopefully all, all, all new trials will have that uh, ongoing in parallel to the main trial. Thank you. Another question for you, uh, Sabrina, is what stage is the verdipocet trial at the within the helium? What timeline do we should we expect? Yeah. So uh, you know, the the we are we basically are uh, essentially very close, or if not at target enrollment uh, for the first three regimens, including verdipocet. So essentially, now we're gonna start uh, following all the participants for twenty four weeks. So we uh, we cannot even begin to close out the study until the last person who was enrolled completes the, uh, the six months uh, period of, of placebo control trial. So, so right now, again, we are uh, fortunately completing enrollment, which means that in about six months, we can start to wrap up the study and, and get the results. Thank you. Um, there's a, uh, a question about AMX035. So if AMX035 gets uh, the approval uh, from FDA, will people on open label for any of the regimens of the platform trial be allowed to take AMX035? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we, we definitely want to allow participants to take standard of care medications. And that's why participants in the uh, platform trial are allowed to take Riluzol uh, and Radicava if they want to take those drugs. So when a new drug gets approved, uh, and hopefully that will be the case um, soon for AMX35, uh, we would allow standard of care. Again, the timing is really unknown uh, and, and out of our control. So so essentially, you know, when, uh, when we see that the drug is approved, uh, you know, then we would take, um, you know, start the process to, to allow that. Uh, and again, I, uh, the timing is, is still un unclear at this time. There's a very nice comment that I'll read just thanking um, all of us and uh, for and for Irfan also for coming on here to get the facts out. People in the media tend to just go for the headline and uh, say if one drug works, doesn't work in one disease, it doesn't in the other. And they, they're not getting the facts correctly or, or uh, know what ALS is about. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And I, I want to take that moment to just thank again our patient advisory group, who was just phenomenal. And we met with them earlier this week. And, um, and great partnership about how to share information and knowledge and really work on this together as a community. So there's a question, maybe Irfan, you can answer this one. What's the primary focus and expectation of Verdipostat? Um, like, how does it work? And, and do we think it might slow down or reverse or what's the mechanism? Sure. So I think that the first point is that Verdipostat is a disease modifying potential treatment. So that means that it should slow down the progression of the disease. Uh, it should not, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, be something that will treat the symptoms. So th those are different kinds of treatments. Uh, so that's the first thing. And then how does it do that? Uh, Radiprocet targets a really important enzyme called myeloperoxidase or MPO, which is a really important enzyme in the body. It's in the myeloid cells. That's why it has the name myeloperoxidase. And in the brain, the myeloid cells, the immune cell cells in the brain are the microglial cells. And it really prevents those cells from causing damage in the brains and spinal cords of people with ALS. That's what we believe. Thank you. Um, Sabrina, there's two questions about two different drugs and whether they might join the platform trial. So I thought maybe you could talk about how drugs join the platform trial. So one is whether neuro might ever be retried in the Healy platform, and the other is about clenbutrol. Yeah, so, uh, so so as you know, the neuron was tried in a different trial, uh, the, you know, a, a series of trials, and then clenbuterol uh, has been tried in small trials. So for, for all the drugs that are out there in development, there is a, a therapy evaluation committee 
uh, that includes uh, different investigators, ALS clinicians, scientists that actively uh, review submissions from companies that want to uh, to enter the, the platform trial. And we also have several you know meetings and conversations with, with industry in general uh, to, to 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 keep um, you know to, to to learn about their developments and see where they are at with different uh, compounds. So essentially, the the, the committee reviews uh, detailed information about uh, every drug that gets submitted. So it means that. The, the, you know, the company or the investigator will need to submit uh, a request to enter the platform trial and then the detailed scientific uh, information gets reviewed uh, and then um, if, if it's considered you know a good fit then the, the drug can can enter the trial so I think you know uh, certainly for 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 drugs that uh, are being tested like clenbuterol for example that was tested in a small trial uh, uh, and if an investigator or companies want to submit it absolutely then it will be reviewed uh, and again we uh, it's sort of a you know we um, companies submit and we also continue to engage uh, with companies or investigators that we know have great ideas to to solicit you know kind of uh, partnerships because I think really we want to keep uh, adding the best drugs to the to the platform. Yeah, thank you. And I do know that Rick Bedlock is you know talking to the manufacturers about this just this idea, but um, they haven't applied yet. So so there's a question at what point, and this is for Sabrina, at what point will we combine multiple drugs in a single trial? That's a great question. So uh, the, the platform trial ap approach has been used in cancer to combine drugs as well. So I think that as we develop new drugs, uh, it's the perfect setup for adding on. So for example, if one of the regimens were positive, then it would be great to, you know, that that it would be, that would become the new standard of care. And then we would build on that and then again, combine uh, a new drug on top of that drug that has become positive. So that's definitely possible. Um, and, and, and I do agree that Ultimately, I think that combination therapy will be important for, for ALS. Thank you. There's a question about whether we can share any results or updates from the clean expanded access protocol that was started in September 2019 at Mass General Hospital. I'm happy to take that one. Go, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So um, I was trying to think, was it really 2019? Uh, but I mean, that's probably accurate. Um, I, I don't have any results now other than to say the following. One is it was very nice of, of clean nanomedicine to provide that drug to us as a EAP, even before we you know, really started the, the platform trial. So that's been going on for a long time. As you know, they, they just announced that they're also going to do a second EAP at three of the Healy Center sites for 15 more people. And that's just getting going. And that's a Holy Cross, Sparrows and um, Hospital for Special Care. But at MGH, we've been doing this for a little bit. We, I don't have any results other than to say that we do have some people who've been on it for more than two years now. Um, that's why I was wondering about the September. Um, and, um, and that we are trying to put together a paper on that. What we don't have is like a good natural history comparison data set because uh, the people in the ERP are people who are not eligible for trials, so that um, we can't really compare them to PROACT database, which is from trials, but we're trying to see what we can learn from that and try to publish that as well. Um, so there's a question, um, um, maybe for Sabrina. So when motor neurons die, why is it that the loss of strength and mobility isn't uniform even within one area of body? Yeah, no, that that's that's true. Uh, so there are uh, so we think that the, as the motor neurons die, uh, they sort of are located in a certain area in the spinal cord, and that will affect. Um, basically, they, they get out from the spinal cord and they go and, and, and innervate or connect to the muscles. And so, as specific areas of the spinal cord are affected. Uh, then specific muscles will be affected. So some muscles are more affected than others. That's actually a pattern that's been seen um, repeatedly. Um, and so really it's it's both um, a pattern that we see in motor neuron disease. And also again, because of the, the motor neurons are located together when kind of the, the spinal cord gets affected in a certain way, certain muscles that are connected uh, to those neurons will be affected first. Um, so, so I don't have a great answer in terms of, you know, why that happens, but we, that's something that we observe um, commonly. Uh, another question for you, Sabrina, is there a specific enrollment closing date for the platform trial? And if not, how soon does a participant need to enroll to be part of it? 
So we, we are open for enrollment. Uh, we, uh, even after A, B, and C uh, are full enrolled, we, we are enrolling in D, as in David, and then uh, we are adding E uh, very soon. Um, so essentially, we anticipate that there will continue to be spots available. Uh, so again, ideally, we will um, never have a gap. Uh, it could be that at some point there might be, uh, you know, a few days when, um, when again, when, uh, when we don't have spots available, but not now, not for the foreseeable future. So um, there's no specific date. There's a question about whether the, the deck from this, this talk will be available after the webinar. Go ahead, Sabrina. Yes, yes, they're all posted on our website, all the previous ones. Maybe, uh, Catherine, you could put in the chat where, where to find that. That'd be great. Um, there's a question about the EAP. I, I don't know whether you or if I want to take this one, which is somebody who's in Chicago, wants to be in the Biohaven EAP at that site, but they've been told that it's already full. Uh, and what, what are their options out there? Uh, Sabrina, if you want to start on that one. Yeah, the, the EAP companion that we have uh, as part of this program that I mentioned at the three sites uh, as a cap in terms of total number of participants uh, divided by three sites. Uh, and then we do recognize that unfortunately it's a small, it's, it's a small program. Uh, it's 35 people total. Uh, so um, so at this stage, uh, again, I think that the sites are, um, you know, uh, filling the, the spots. Uh, ideally, we would want to continue to expand EAPs um, and, and also, uh, I guess, uh, I would assume additional requests can be made um, by physicians. So I don't know, Irfan, if you, if you have any additional comments. Uh, I, I don't have any additional comments. I'll just say that we, you know, we know EAP is incredibly important to the community, and you know, I think understanding uh, the EAP through the pilot EAP program for the Healy ALS platform trial will be, you know, sort of really useful and help us to plan for the future. Thank you. Um, there's um, a question, um, and uh, we might not be able to answer this in two minutes, but why do you have placebo every time you do a trial and not rely on past placebo data? Sabrina, do you wanna? Yeah, I can start. So, uh, you know, for, um we need um, concurrent placebo data to make sure that we uh, compare the active data to uh, a population that's been randomized at that time. That's the only way to be able to tell if the, the drug really works. Now, if there was a drug that would cause a dramatic effect, such as, for example, reversing the disease, uh, then it would be uh, perhaps possible to rely on historical data. However, again, because we're really trying to look at uh, drugs that slow down the disease at this stage, although obviously we hope that some could really stop the disease or reverse it, uh, we do need to have the concurrent comparison. Older data sets, may be biased by different, for different reasons, because they're older, because uh, the, the, the participants in older trials or previous trials were enrolled elsewhere. And so their placebo data may not be actually a good comparator for trials that happen now. So that's one of, one of the main reasons. And the last question we have is, is about AMX035. And the question is really, um, do you need both, the, the, both components of it? Um, or can you drop one of them? Um, so so the, the principle here based on data in the lab was that the two drugs combined worked better than each alone. That's why they were combined. In other words, the, 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 the combination as well as the ratio uh, between the two was derived from data in the lab where the combination at the specific uh, dosages uh, was the one that worked best. So that's the data we, we have so far. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we don't have one next week because it's a, the Niels meeting, I believe, but we'll be back on the 14th. Uh, thank you, um, Irfan and Courtney for joining us and Allison and Catherine always for your support. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Nice talking with you. Thank you. Bye.